Welcome everybody. My name is Ivan Novik and I'm going to today talk about how to optimize performance on Greenplum database. <clears throat> You've got your system up, it's in production and many users are running it and now you're thinking what are the things I need to do to optimize the performance. So I'm going to run through about 14 different things you can look at to try to improve the performance of your system running at Greenplum. And to illustrate that, I'm going to share my screen and go through quite a number of different tools and things you can do. So the first thing is GP Checker. It's important that you know the capacity of your hardware. Every machine that you run, every VM image or every cloud instance has a certain amount of capacity in terms of um, throughput, network performance, disk performance. And GP Checkproof is a tool you can use to measure the performance of the system outside of running Greenplum so that you know the full capacity of your system. Then when you compare a running Greenplum cluster, you can see, is it running at the expected speed or is it uh, leaving bandwidth on the table? Um, this also can be useful to compare a given hardware or a given environment to other hardware. And, and ideally, what you want is Greenplum to be able to maximize the resource utilization that the machine can do. But obviously, it can't run any faster than the hardware that, that it's given. So that's tip number one, cheap to check for. Tip number two is a old school utility called TOP. I highly recommend if you're trying to understand your system to run the top command to log into the cluster, go to one of the segment servers and just run top. Top will show you what the system is doing. You'll see a lot of Postgres processes running and you can see the idle CPU, the system CPU, the user CPU, and that just gives you a, a taste of what the system is, is doing at this time. So definitely take a look and run top on your cluster. Let's go to tool number three. Tool number three is SAR. SAR is another classic Linux tool. It runs in the background and you can go back if somebody complained, hey, you know, the system wasn't looking good at 840, you can go back and see all of the machines in the cluster and what, they're, what they were doing from a CPU point of view, memory point of view, network point of view, swapping, et cetera, and get an understanding historically of uh, what the resource utilization is and if you think there's anything interesting or unusual, or even if there's one machine doing something different than other machines, that could be an indicator that potentially there's a problem with one of your systems. All right, that's tool number three. Now let's go to tool number four. Tool number four is the Greenplum Command Center. The Greenplum Command Center has, is a GUI, graphical user interface, and has a whole host of features. Uh, you can, from the graphical interface, you can monitor the overall cluster state, segment status, cluster metrics, post metrics. Um, you can see live query details, query history. Um, you get alerts in the system. So definitely bring up the command center, poke around there, look at the, I would look at the history view. The history view, you can drill in and see what the system is doing at different times and overlay the query concurrency to the system metrics and see if you can notice any correlations or patterns. So definitely get the command center. The next thing is the command center has a tool or a schema called GP metric schema. The GP metric schema has all of these tables and UDFs that you can use to analyze um, your system. So for example, system history saves the CPU usage Query history shows the query history, the query usage with the different SQLs and the resource utilization of the query. So all of these different tables and user-defined functions, this, these are interesting ones like returns for each user number of queries whose runtime is longer than the input interval per hour in the specified time range. So these functions can really help you to find um, misbehaving queries or things that you might want to optimize. Um, the next one is the Linux settings. It's the, in, given an individual system, there's a wide variety of the performance that a system can do depending on how it's configured. Now we, through over a decade of experience, put our notes here in how to configure a Linux system 
Um, and there's many different settings like XFS mount options, system CTL configuration. So really you want to read through this and compare it to your system and see any widely disparate numbers that might be leaving the system not running at maximum performance. Um, the next thing to do is to look at your resource groups. So the resource groups allow you to create different workloads for a different priority and set up concurrencies and CPU allocations, memory allocations to the different groups. So for example, you have a high priority group, you wanna make sure they get 30% CPU, you can allocate that and you can give them a fixed number of concurrency, everybody else will, will be in the queue until, until they're, they're ready to run. So you definitely wanna review your resource groups and make sure that they're optimized for the kind of workloads you're trying to run. An advanced tip on resource groups, if you really have one group that you wanna give dedicated resources to with, with very little context switching, you can also use CPU set. CPU set is a, a optional feature in resource groups, and it allows you to dedicate certain cores to a workload. So have a look at CPU set if you really have a low latency workload that needs to guarantee performance work. <clears throat> so that's resource groups. Now, if you wanna do something more advanced with workload management, you can create rules. You can say, based on certain conditions, identify these queries. So let's say they're coming in at a certain resource group, they're doing a certain amount of spilling, or they're running for a certain amount of time. Based on different conditions, you can create a dynamic rule and the system will automatically take an action. So the actions include things like terminating the query and sending the message to the user, or moving it to another resource group that may have a lower capacity or putting a log in the system. So these different uh, rules can be set up that can help you to uh, have better control of your system, especially if you think there are certain toxic queries or toxic workloads that are interfering with other users. So that's the workload management. Now let's talk about the concept of canary query. I just put it in Google canary query. It shows different products, whatnot. It's a generic concept. A canary query is a query that you run, let's say every five minutes or every 10 minutes that has a fixed profile. You know it's gonna run in an idle system, let's say in five seconds. And that allows you to test, you know, how well your system is performing uh, against itself. So if, it, if the canary query runs in five seconds during an idle time, and during a peak time, if let's say it runs in 500 seconds, that's 100 times slower, you know your system is struggling to, to manage its resources. But for example, if, if users call up and say, hey, I think the system's slow, but the canary query keeps running five seconds, every five minutes, five seconds, five seconds, five seconds, your system is good. There's something wrong with that user or that query. So canary query is very useful to set up and make sure that um, you can measure the system yourself before you have the unpredictableness of user queries. So this could be set up through CronTab or it could be set up however schedule you have and just make sure you're running a consistent query and measuring the outputs that you know you can measure and benchmark your system based on your own environment. Okay, now we kind of covered a lot of the overall system things. Now we get more into specific schema and query issues. So the first thing about specific schema and query issues is if you don't have good optimizer statistics, the optimizer won't be able to get a good plan. So I recommend running AnalyzeDB. AnalyzeDB will be kind of an incremental um, statistics gathering tool. So if there are any missing statistics, it'll recollect the missing ones, but not redo the ones that are missing. Um, it also has some concurrency options to do it in parallel threads. But in any way, one way or the other, you need to make sure that you're running Analyze or Analyze DB and making sure your statistics are up to date. Otherwise, the query plans could be not very intelligent because without statistics about your data, we can't really give you a good query plan. So make sure you've got statistics up to date and potentially look in the command center or in one of the system views to see if you can notice any out of date statistics, which might be giving you bad plans. And then when you want to go and look at the plan, you can use explain. So when you put explain in the front of the SQL, in, instead of actually running the SQL, it'll tell you the query plan. And if you're experienced, you, you can really look at this and kind of read it and see, oh, it's doing um, a sequential scan and it's doing a filter. 
Maybe you thought it was supposed to be using an index, or maybe it's using an index, and you thought it was supposed to be doing a sequential scan, or maybe it's doing lots of broadcasts and you don't know why it's broadcasting you know, a huge table. So looking at the explained plan of an individual query is part of the process to identify what's going on with an individual query. Now, as far as designing the schema, I recommend watching this video, Understanding Dis Data Distribution on our Green Film Database channel. This video goes through the concept of um, assigning distribution keys and how to and how the database and the optimizer will then create query plans. Um, essentially, what you want to do is make sure that when you distribute your data across the cluster, that it is done evenly, that there's not um, a skew in the data, that you haven't picked a distribution key that, um, for example, if I picked is customer Boolean, true or false, and I have 100 segments, you're not going to be able to distribute that 100 ways. But if you pick like an order ID or something that can distribute random, you know, across many nodes, that's going to be good. The other thing is thinking about the joins you're going to be doing. Because if you have 10 tables you're going to join all the time, if they have the same distribution key, let's say like order ID or product ID or something that's the same, then that means all those 10 tables can be co-located and you can do joins without motion. So this is an important thing, looking at your distribution keys and your joins and seeing if you're co-locating the joins, that can be a big performance boost. Now, the next bit is not about distribution, but about partitioning. So if you look at very large tables, you can get a huge performance boost by partitioning them vertically. So here you can see a sales table is vertically partitioned by month. So what that means is every partition of the sales table is stored separately. Actually, there's two partitions here. There's two levels. There's the date and then the region. And really what you want to do is align your partitioning strategy to your query patterns. So if you tend to do queries with a where clause and the condition is for a limited amount of the sales. So let's say all the time I'm doing a report for um, the sales in Europe in March, then we can basically directly read this data right here. We will bypass all this other data, right? And if you have thousands of partitions, and your where clause is frequently within a subset of those partitions, you can have 100 times or 1,000 times performance improvement by having a good partitioning strategy. One word to the wise, be avoid over partitioning because creating you know, a million partitions, you create too much metadata and that generally slows the system down. So you wanna be having, let's say for a huge table of terabytes or petabytes table, you wanna be doing something like, you know, between 100 and 1,000 partitions to really get two or three orders of magnitude of data reduction. When combined with data distribution, it, it becomes even more powerful. You get, uh, you know, let's say a thousand segments and a thousand partitions, you've got a million times um, data reduction from a standalone database with one, with one partition. Um, now, in addition to thinking of the partitioning, let's think about the table um, parameters when you create the table. We have heap tables, we have append-only tables, we have columnar tables. These all have different performance benefits. So in general, think about using heap tables when you're doing lots of small transactions um, or uh, updates, deletes, kind of more of an OLTP-like workload, then heap will be ideal. On the other side, if you're doing um, data warehousing and you have a huge table, then you can tend to think about a compressed table, compressed either row-oriented or column-oriented, so that you can have a data reduction from compression and a speed up in the data warehousing scanning. Now, the compression um, has different options. Um, you can do more compression, which takes more CPU cycles, or less compression, which is less CPU cycles. And then also, you want to think about how many columns you'll be querying. So if you have a very wide table of 500 columns and you're frequently querying five columns, columnar will be good. If you're frequently returning all the columns, then probably row oriented is better. Now, another word to the wise would be that, again, you can create too much metadata. If you created a million tables with a thousand columns and every, um, and every table was columnar, you're, you're breaking the data into too many small pieces. So you wanna, Generally speaking, you can start with the concept of using heap. Now, if the data is very big, 
go to either an append only table, let's say append only compressed, row oriented. And then if you're doing very uh, fine grained selects, then say, okay, let's change, let's think about using columnar instead of um, AO uh, row oriented. So start with, by default, go with heap. Then it's a big table, go with compressed AO. And then you know you're going to be query pattern will be across a thin set of columns in a wide table, go to columnar. Or if you really are going to access it infrequently and want maximum compression, then look at columnar in that kind of default order. Last but not least, kind of a bonus tool. If you're really a Linux guru and want to geek out on the internals or in the code, or if you're a developer running the perf tool on a, on a system, and you have to be careful, it's a kind of a, a could be an invasive tool, but definitely usable. Perf will tell you everywhere from the green plum stack, the Postgres stack, um, any ancillary demons on the system and the Linux kernel, what's taking the most resources. And that could be a, a tip or an indicator of something that you might want to prove. So I hope with all these different tools and approaches, you can see that um, it's not magical to, to understand your system. You can use all these different tools. There's a plethora of tools and you can figure out how to um, make your system perform better. And really, you want to drive your system to its limit. Let Green Plum push it all the way to its limit and get the maximum performance out of what you're doing. Thanks very much. See you around.